You want to come in? And Remedy, is that you rapping or is that? Nah, that's one of that? our brothers, Doc Ben. That's nice, bro. Barbara, and I love you. Ninety four point three WYBC, the rhythm of the city and home of the Juan Castillo morning show. This is moving target radio. I'm your host, Jay Kemp. And with me, as always, is my comrade and brother, Remedy Sharif. What's good, brother? Peace and blessings. So for those of you who tune in outside of Connecticut online or on YouTube uh, and you're in the live feed right now, which is moving target media on YouTube, we are here in New Haven. Uh, demanding justice for Stephanie Washington and Paul Witherspoon, whose lives were almost taken by Hamden police officer Devin Eaton and Yale police officer Terrence or Terrence Pollock. Uh, these individuals opened fire on two young people and have yet to be held accountable. So before we go into this conversation of what's going on, I want to acknowledge everyone, including Moving Target's Remedy Sharif. Thank you, brother, for being on the front line. Um, everyone that came out together and stood in solidarity, there is no question that the pulse of New Haven showed up for the people, our young people. All right. And regardless of how you feel about the protesting and rallies and saying it don't work, doesn't matter what our young people need to see. What we need to see is solidarity and unity for everyone in New Haven. So salute to the New Haven family for standing together. All right. So. There's a lot to unpack here, you know what I'm saying? So today we have author of Black Man's Guide to Law Enforcement in America and former New Haven police officer, Shafiq Abdul-Sabor. What's going on, brother? Good morning, yeah. Thank you for coming through. And we also have a legend, a, a community activist with the wisdom to really show us strategy, uh, Mother Fair. How you doing, Mother? Good morning. Thank you for having me. A Thank true queen warrior. True queen warrior. Uh, and then we also have a professor as well, right? That's Kafani? right. All right, That's so right. Kafani Ture. That's right. All right, Kafani I want to Ture. make sure I got the name right. No, and, it's all good. And uh, you're also a former police officer as well. Absolutely. Okay, all right. So we got a lot to talk about when it comes to the training of police officers, when it comes to this whole situation as well. Um, and we have some more guests that are coming through. Pastor John Lewis is coming through, and um, I know Carrie Ellington, I believe, will be stopping by. Uh, but to begin, Mother Fair, where are we with this situation right now? Let's just look at where we are with the two officers. Are they being held accountable? Where are we? Uh, first of all, I want to say, and I didn't realize I'm hoarse yesterday. <laughs> <clears throat> but first of all, I want to say for those who think protest doesn't work, I'll tell them protest does work. Mm -hmm. Protest for me is a step one. I think the problem is that people think that protest is the only thing that we have to do. Protest brings awareness. It also brings unity. I spoke to a young uh, woman last night 
who her brother was killed by Hamden police. Mm. And she talked about how she wished she had had that when her brother died. No one, you know, she didn't have this kind of solidarity. Wow. And so, you know, protest does work as long as we recognize that we have to go beyond that. Yeah. And I, in my head already, I have all kinds of different actions in my head that we need to be doing. Yeah, we're going to definitely get into those. Yes. But right now, from what I heard, is that both of the officers have been put on administrative leave. With pay? Uh, of course, with pay. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Which is something that's known. just always been mind-boggling to me yeah. because if I had shot those people, oh, yeah. I would have been arrested on the scene. I'd be sitting behind bars with high bail so I can't get out. If I didn't mop a floor at Yale Hospital, right. I would be left with yeah. no pay. So it's like that's always been... That's some of the work that needs to happen. We need right. to stop that from happening. Yeah. But anyway, they're on they're home sitting home uh, on pay, and and I'm sure watching everything unfold. Probably never expected it to unfold. Um, police chief and um, mayors from New Haven and 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 Hampton have both had a couple of meetings now uh, about moving this process of the investigation forward, so mm. it doesn't drag on. Because one of my first questions that first night. We met with the chief is, okay, you're talking about investigation. How swiftly can this happen? Mm -hmm. And I asked the mayor, I said, I believe if you push the issue that you can make this um, expedited, which they claimed in the media, at least, that they are expediting the investigation. So, you know, demands make a difference. Right. How do you feel about the coverage? I don't know if you've been watching the national coverage. Have any of you been watching the national coverage of this? I haven't. What, what do you think about the fact that the coverage has not been us here. It's been a lot of Yale students. Do you feel like that makes a difference in in what we do with this whole situation and how we move with this whole situation? So I, I think that part of, um, you know, there's a lot of dynamics at play. And um, you see the valuation of how communities, black communities mm. and communities that are disenfranchised in communities that are not perceived at at being the status quo, yeah. uh, how they're portrayed. So what was really interesting, I've been watching a lot of the live feeds off of YouTube and the raw feeds. One um, recently, the New Haven folks that was out there that I could identify were saying, you know, white people to the outside protect us. You know, all of the Yale students, you know, get to the outside and mingle in the crowd and i wow. even heard um one of the reporters talk about how the, the crowd was saturated with yale students and i've also heard from you know both uh, other community members and law enforcement that you know it presented a different dynamic because the yale students were mixed in there it was clear that the way yale students are policed and the way um, the community is policed is two different levels so the higher standard takes the precedent. And, mm -hmm. you know, we know this, at least I know this, when I followed very closely after um, Freddie Gray and, you know, the comments then from President Obama, um, you know, were very condescending of the young people out there that were protesting and they were rioting and looting. Mm -hmm. um, but at that same time, uh, we also had the, the shooting mass shooting that um, of Dallin Roof, who, you know, he murdered all these black people and said, we want to start a race war, but you could not find any demeaning comments that was even parallel mm -hmm. from any body, which included the time at that time, the president on down the legislators that, you know, said this is an animalistic behavior or these people are thugs. And mm -hmm. that. So, it, you know, this is not just about this incident right now in Yale students. This is something per pervasive in our culture. It's woven in the fabric in the mindset, in the what I could refer to it, the DNA of our American society, and it yeah it, yeah go ahead, come on, go, go, ahead, ahead, go, ahead, go ahead, I apologize, brother. Um, yeah, no, this is this is beautiful to see Yale University students in solidarity with the community. Often, Yale University is sort of pitted against the community. Mm -hmm. In other words, the the Dixwell Avenue community or Fairhaven is sort of constructed as the others, and Yale University is the privileged, uh, you know, uh, superior sort of space and those who inhabit that space. But one of the things I want to point out to you, and I just acknowledge right here, I'm a employee at Yale University, but I'm black. Mm -hmm. And so I still get the residential gates 
slammed in front of my face. I still have students who look at me uh, with this curiosity as if I don't belong. And there are other black... You're an educator. And I'm an educator. And there's other black and brown students at Yale University who can testify to this experience, Mm. right? And so to see these students sort of get the fire in their bosom and to realize that on campus or off campus, that could have been them, Mm. right? It's, it's, it's just reassuring that we're, 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 we have the promise of, of a new generation sort of taking the mantle and sort of pursuing social justice. We've got a lot of police officers in our community, but we have very little justice. We do. And, and, and to me, in understanding the national coverage aspect of this thing, to me, it's a travesty of what we're seeing. It reminds me, and we got countless, countless accounts of um, in history of um, people of color, black men, black women that have created things, have created uh, different different things, and their faces were taken off of these inventions, and um, European faces were put on the front of those inventions. Black people have been, people of color have been at the core of everything in America, and our faces have been taken out of the picture. This fight is a fight that we're fighting. This fight is a fight that we're fighting. Sure. This fight is a fight Say that, that three we're times, fight. real fast. fighting for uh, for the liberation of of us, That's for right. the liberation of our people. And I think it's a travesty that they are taking our face off of what we are fighting for. That's right. right. It's a travesty. So, That's so right. in in some end, Kalfani, I hear you saying that it's a great thing to see the unity and solidarity. But at the at, at the same time, Rem, are you saying that it's still problematic the fact that we feel as though we need to be protected it's, by it, yes sir okay yes sir it's, okay. Ve- it's very problematic it's very problematic from let's look at the mental aspect we are still set in a condition of weakness we are still set in a condition of we need you please help and it's okay um understand our, our european brothers and sisters if you will it is okay if you want to help it is okay if you feel like you need to help and you should if you're standing for one humanity if you're standing for peace if you're standing for love you should feel like you want to help but we need to reach deep down inside of us people of color and understand that we have to help ourselves stop looking outward and when we are being covered nationally we would ask america and let's make that one of our demands Put the face, the proper face, to what you are saying. Well, I think this comes down to owning our own media. Absolutely. And, and, and you know I'm always in support of that. We need to control our narrative. And this is a perfect example of the narrative was put out to the people on national stages in a different way as opposed to what we know in our own community. We need to own our own media. Mm-hmm. Yes, sir. Um, I want to move because I know we have a little bit of time to cover so much, um, but I want to also make it clear, Mother Fair, you and I were talking about how we need to have a very strategic conversation. Yes, we do. Talking about some strategic steps, Yes. but it's closed doors. No press, yes. so I'm sure a lot of people won't show up. <laughs> no press, no, no, none of that. This yeah. is closed in. This is family, Just right? Talk about us, absolutely, and what we got to do next. Um, however, I do want to go into uh, the the situ something else with the situation. So we have two former police officers here in the build in the space right now. I would love to hear from both of you. How would you have handled, or how should the police have handled the situation? What would be the best? maneuvers or tactics that could have been used in this situation here that would have avoided all of this. And and I just want to say before they respond, I'd like to put a lot of emphasis on what would you have done? You know, a lot of that because they can sit here now and say, I would have done it this way, but in blue uniform right around your coworkers, what, how would you have done this? Right. Or, or maybe a better question would be, how are you trained to yes. to handle that? Yes. And and either one of you could take it. You go first. <laughs> All right. <laughs> That's what's up. That's yeah, Bar- Barbara took over the show. She's the host sorry. now. I'm sorry. <laughs> go, you be next. Jay. I'm gonna go back. Yeah. I'm gonna go back. That's what's up. So I I, I should I should note that I grew up in the city of Newark, New Jersey. I have police officers in my family, yeah. uh, but I grew up in a hard city. And I've seen a lot of police brutality and I've seen a lot of racialized police violence. So me going into law enforcement was to understand how this how this comes to be, you know, Mm. and also my entrance into law enforcement was to make my community better. Now, I understand something uh, pretty quickly when I got into law enforcement that I was too black for the blue uniform 
Mm-hmm. And uh, unfortunately, I be- in the blue uniform, I became too blue for the black community. So I was always out on the periphery, but that was a perfect pace, uh, uh, a location to be to sort of understand this phenomenon. I think it's important to sort of backtrack a little bit. You know, as my mentor would say, slavery placed the black body at the bottom of the social order. Mm. And what this means is that black people lack credibility. We have a deficit of credibility. It means that you lack more authority. And so you're always seen as a question mark. And it doesn't matter if that's a black officer, a white officer, an Asian or a Latino officer. If you are black or Latino, you are a question mark. In fact, you are a threat to organize and ordered society. Mm -hmm. You are symbolic of disorder. And police officers are attributed with the highest degree of more authority. So that's why, you know, as I was trained, if, if you do something wrong, you cover your ass by saying, and I apologize for cursing, but you say, I feared, mm. right? You have to evoke fear in the police report. And that's that's pretty much the beginning, the genesis of covering yourself. Now, Yeah, and I find that that's a problem too. Now, what, what you know, the other problem here is, is that, so if you understand that my body has been placed at the bottom of the social order. That's one thing. The second thing is police officers often don't critique other police officers, right? Because we need that fellow officer for our backup. I'm just going to say this. You know, Chief Higgins at Yale University is a great person. Uh, I think Anthony Campbell is, is a wonderful person. And I think the majority of police officers who put on their badge and uniforms have the desire to do a good job. Did you see the video? Yeah, I saw all the videos. In fact, I drove up a- a- just after the situation happened. So what, where do you feel through your training? I mean, we could clearly well, see where a, they... F- there's a couple of things here. Yeah. I, I'm not sure. I've never been trained to, to effect a traffic stop in the way that the Hamden police officer engaged in that traffic stop. Mm. Second of all, you can't just tell me that there was a black guy in jeans and a T-shirt running down the street. That could be any black guy. Right. I need something more specific before I engage somebody because the encounter between a police officer and the average citizen can be traumatic, particularly if you're a person of color. So with the Yale, uh, from what we saw on these, and I don't want to stay too much on this. I want to go more into other ways that police are trained. But the Yale officer, from what, I, from what I'm, I'm hearing and from what I saw, came out of the car already shooting. Right. So he was already engaging and he wasn't very aware well, of what was going this. on. Well, let me just say this. I think that we, unfortunately, we're going to have to wait until um, both the body cam footage is displayed or, or sort of shared with the community in the spirit of transparency. But from my vantage point, looking at the videos, it seemed like the Hamden officer fired first. Right. right, and I could be wrong about that, but I, I I counted at least maybe nine shots, but you know the way they sort of rolled this out, you know there was a flash from the cell phone video, or he abruptly got out of the car. Well, the video evidence sort of contradicts mm-hmm. that, right? And so part of it is is that we got to get to the heart of the matter. We fear black and brown people, absolutely, and we got to deal with that. So I want to move to you, Officer Shafiq, because some of the work that you do with, a lot of the work you do with Pastor John, um, John Lewis, is working with police officers and training them on, you know, implicit bias and things that they uh, experience within themselves before they even join the force or even them being police officers, you know, dealing with how they might look and view the uh, the people that they serve in the community. Can you talk a little bit about exactly what you do when you do your training and workshops with police officers? Yeah, so um, before I go any further, let me just say that um, I wish the, the young man and, and the young girl involved in this incident and their family that um, they have a, a, recover, a speedy recovery, but, you know, having worked with people who are victims of gun violence and, you know, issues around trauma, you know, for everybody needs to understand that this will be a, a lifelong process for them mm. to try to address that. Uh, also, you know, I do I do know personally know the officers that are involved as well as I have a very close relationship with Ronnell Higgins, the Yale Police Chief. Which I just tell you, my opinion, I think Ronnell is is one of is a very good police chief. Right. Um, I know him as a person, and I know, I know him very well, and I know him personally. Um, I have been in a police shooting, and I was fired from the New Haven Police Department following my shooting. Uh, and I was 
in the forefront of all of my police tactics being criticized um, from per me personally uh, down to professionally. So I know what it's like to be on the other side where those two officers are right now, and I can tell you this. When you are a black cop and you are a black cop involved in something like this, the standard and the threshold of, of your actions are judged even more, um, there's more scrutiny on it mm. than it is yep. when the officer is not black. And let me just say that, you know, it would be irresponsible and appropriate for me to criticize those officers because the way law enforcement is, is established, it doesn't really matter sometimes how much training you have if you legitimately feel that your life is like in danger and that you've never been presented with this situation before, it's going to be very difficult for you to follow a script. So I will use and flip over to the Walker shooting in South Carolina where we saw uh, the, 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 the gentleman fighting the, the, the police officer and they fight and then he runs and then the police officer chases him and shoots him and you hear bang, bang, bang from the back of this gentleman to that one last shot where it seems like he lines up the shot. Now, I had talked to a lot of my, uh, you know, people that I work with in law enforcement, both black and white, and everybody kind of agreed, like, wow, he lined up the last shot. Mm -hmm. Like, he's, been, he's really been working on that, you know, in his mind, that threshold. So when you see that and then you see these two videos, it's a different case. And here's the other thing, too. You know, unfortunately you have videos that are not released by the police. They're amateur videos for the most part, but they are evidence. They'll be used as evidence. And it is very difficult for the public to see that and then go, oh, wow, I see this. Oh, wow, I saw one last night. They put out two now, so they put, got them, the news got them side by side happening simultaneously, and you see this going and that going. And, you know, hey, the reality is, does it look bad? Absolutely. It looks it looks horrible, right? But for me, not critiquing the officer's technique, not critiquing the officer's mindset. It is, you know, the blatant, how do we go about with the threshold of what we perceive to be the actual violence that could be legislated against a person or against mm -hmm. an officer? And I will tell you, you know, hey, listen, no disrespect to the officers, anybody out there. You know, that's a felony stop. Right. And any officer will tell you, you know, there are pretty standard procedures in a felony stop, which is time and distance. The, the sure. farther you are away from the threat and the more time you give yourself sure. in, uh, away from the threat, meaning distance, it gives you the opportunity to make a plan, call somebody else, get other people there, to help you make a good informed decision so that you do not find yourself in what would be considered exigent circumstances where you have to act immediately. Mm. So is that a judgment call? Absolutely. Does that come with training experience? Absolutely. Can you get that training in the classroom? A lot of times, no. You, you get that training from being in the field. You get that training from maybe um, other cops that you work with that are more seasoned, that are more... Um, informed that might be more compassionate or less compassionate and just don't want to have their paycheck take a hit, right? you know, because they're home. So it's, it's so many issues around that. But this is what I will say. I love black people, and I love the police because I was a police officer, and I'm retired. And despite my struggles, I spent a lifetime there, and I have relationships there, and I care about people there. The issue right now, from my perspective in America, we need to look at, the use of force around deadly force that law enforcement officers use towards communities. It was enacted back in 1965 as a, um, a solution for what at that time the government called ghetto trouble. Mm -hmm. And it was enacted pr primarily around 1967 in the uh, Chicago riots when black people were rioting for civil rights, and then Mayor, I believe it was Mayor Daley of Chicago said, use deadly force to protect the property downtown. I do not want looters 
um, these black people and these looters tearing up our city. So if you've got to use deadly force to stop them, use the deadly force. Then the police chief said, I can't order the officers to do that because I don't have any orders to do that. So they said, well, the, then the, the, uh, the mayor said, well, we'll create a general order. So they created a general order to use deadly force, and then later that was reciprocated, I believe, within the same year by, I believe it was Maryland. Um, Baltimore used the same thing to protect their city, and that act has now become a national thing, and it stayed there. So we need to understand when everybody says, oh, what did the officer do? And they said, there was no use of deadly force before black people in rioting in the civil rights. So if it was put together for that and they haven't peeled it back, just like the SWAT teams, the SWAT teams were put together only to deal with the Black Panthers. That was the sole purpose of the SWAT team. It was, it was, there was no other reason. And guess what? There's no more Black Panthers. So we got to go back as a nation and look at this because you, I know there's guns in America. We get that. And I know people are dangerous and I get that. But, you know, there's other analogies from other countries that when the police are not as, uh, I guess you would say, put on the offensive by society, that society also backs off. So it's a, it's a theory, but it's a fact that we haven't revisit the deadly force act. And I didn't want to, Rhyme, but that's a rhyme. <laughs> baby, baby. <laughs> Bars. <laughs> See, for me, that's, that's, yeah. that's the work that needs to be done. That's the work that I tell people all the time. After we finish protesting, then we need to start looking at some of the policies that allow these the police officers to have yes. all the power they have. When I was uh, assigned to the police task force in New Haven, the first policy I, I wanted to look at was excessive force. Of course, you know, I was ignored, expected. But I kept pushing that. The excessive force is just so broad that they could pretty much do anything they want to do. Mm. And then you and hide behind that policy to say that what I did was not outside of the policy. And so that's the real work that people need to do. And that's when you're not going to see these huge crowds because that's the real work. And until that's done, they, w they will always hide behind that policy with whatever they do. Oh, Mother Fair, you are just right <laughs> on point right there and on time. <laughs> um, Yousef Shaw. Uh, salute to Yousef Shaw for Electric Drum coming up next. So, yeah, well, what's up, you brother? Know, uh, good morning, everybody. I just wanted to um, chime in on this situation because I've seen these uh, situations happen so much in New Haven, uh, going all the way back to uh, the shooting and uh, murder of uh, Malik Jones. Mm. Um we do definitely need to look at uh, the use of force laws that are on the books in just about every sovereignty in this country. There is a use of force law that allows police officers to do the types of things that they do. Um, I chaired the Public Safety Committee here in the city of New Haven for over four years and was on the Public Safety Committee when a lot of shootings happened. I remember uh, what happened to Brother, Sh uh, Brother Shafiq and, you know, the, the dynamics and the politics behind this are overwhelming when you look at these things. You have to begin to start looking at the laws and the general orders that are being put in place by police departments and public safety committees on state level. Mm. And, I, and You and have to change those laws. Now, we thank Sister Fair for going out and creating the awareness because we need the awareness. But I agree with you, sister. The real work needs to be done on changing the laws. Yes. Because if you cannot go into court and say, I felt for my life, therefore I needed to use deadly force. Because if you, if you read the uh, Michael Darrington's determination and decision on the use of force that was used on Malik, they determined that that use of force was reasonable and justified. Mm -hmm. So if it's reasonable and justified, it's reasonable and justified because of the way the laws are built and constructed to protect a certain person in these situations. Now, we know that the police are judge, jury, and sometimes executioner on the street. We have to begin to change that. And the only way we can change that is to change the laws. I've been on deadly task force. I, I mean, Sister Fair has been on deadly task force. 
but there's never work on that. And we have the minds in our community to do it. We need to get to that work and start doing it now. So and if I could just yeah. add, too. Uh, so we need to understand, too, na nationally, and I know people get really upset. This is a, a, a issue that when we get to where we are right now, everybody gets really frustrated. Like, I want the body cams. I want this. I want the officers fired. I want that. L officers are attached to the municipality. Yes. Or the agency. Uh, they're in unions. In most cases, they're in police unions. The union contract, the CBA, has very defined language, which basically says, listen, if the officer does anything, you know, they're afforded that process that everybody in the union, somebody mentioned about mopping floors. Well, the union just can't send you home from Yale or wherever <laughs> and say, you ain't getting paid because you can have a union rep that's going to file a grievance and... When that comes to resolution, if you've been out for 280 days or 365, the state, the city, or that institution, wherever, got to back pay you. They don't want to back pay. So they're going to send you home with pay. Almost everybody, that's going to happen mm, with everybody. Right. That's number one. Right. So should you fire the person? You could fire them, but if you fire them and they win that case back, you're going to pay them that money. You're going to pay them that back money. So those are so and, and that's gonna cause another injury technically to the residents or sure. whoever the people at the institution. That's number one. Number two, police in the and this is the United States of America can use the necessary amount of force to effectuate the the arrest. The end period and it's built right into the law. The necessary amount of force to effectuate the, the arrest. And Congress has not defined unreasonable use of force because they have not yet defined reasonable use of force. Reasonable use of force is the necessary amount of force needed to effectuate the arrest. I was in Washington, D.C., two blocks from Washington, uh, the White House, with over 200 police agencies from around the country, NAACP leaders, ACLU, everybody named Mama, in the room watching all of the videos of all the people who got shot and killed by the police that was unarmed, all the high-profile case. And the uh, Fraternal of Police and PERF and the, uh, and the Police Chief Association and all the leaders, they were going back in the room for two hours about, hey, why don't we just go to Con And this is about three years ago. They said, hey, why don't we go back to Congress? and get Congress to define for once and for all, we want them to break down what is um, force, excessive force. And they was like, nope, left the room. Nobody wanted to touch it because that's that window. Here's my last number three, seal the deal. Most powerful thing that any law enforcement officer in the United States has, most powerful weapon, is not the gun. It is their ability to make that decision. Officer discretion. Mm. Mm. However I see it, however I believe it, and that was further ratified in the Tamir Rice case when the investigators said, no matter what we do in looking at the optics after the fa after fact, we still can't put ourselves in the shoes of that officer when it's happening, and no other officer can put themselves in the shoes of that officer. And that was law, and they cleared Tamir Rice. So can I, I, want, can yeah, I please, please say Rice. something? Because please. I'm and sitting I here follow up. And I'm fighting sorry, tears Barbara. right now. This is what PTSD is about. Mm -hmm. Because while he's talking, I'm thinking about being under green two years ago, yep. doing absolutely nothing. I remember this. Nothing. Officers surrounded me, mm -hmm. put me in cuffs, dragged me off the green. That's right. And humiliated you, me. And you didn't even initiate And anything. I did absolutely nothing. I went through internal affairs. This is all their process. I went through internal affairs. I went to the police commission, the chief, the mayor. And as far as they were concerned, it was all within policy because of that that word, discretion. I could go to court and lose because they'll bring up the policy that allows that discretion. Mm. 
I have a daughter who's probably listening to me now, and if she is, she's probably beyond tears mm. because the police at a traffic stop dragged her out of her car, threw her to the ground, had bruises in her arms for months. Her boyfriend was sitting there at gunpoint and couldn't even do anything. So I think about the trauma he has to be mm. facing every day to know he's sitting by his woman and can't do a thing to save her. Mm. She went through the same process, and they did absolutely nothing. That's why when people talk to me about reform, I don't want to hear about reform, because you know what reform is? It's from going from slavery to black codes to the war on drugs. We continue to hold on to this supremacy, this system of white supremacy, and we never think about doing anything but moving things around in the chessboard. Yeah. When I talk to people, all I hear is dismantle. This whole darn system needs to dismantle right from the freaking roots yes, of racism. Yes, and until we're ready to do that work, this mess will continue to happen. That's right. So I'm sorry, but Shafiq, listening to you, I just wanted to scream. I'm sorry, but that, and, and I mean, this is the reality yeah. Yeah, of no, your a, policy. Right, I mean, right. I, 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 and, and I'll be real quick. And I and I can and I continually and I continually talk about this that the whole system again needs to be dismantled because they change the narrative anytime they feel, anytime they want. And look at what we're faced with. When will we get to the mindset? of being able to create our own society within this society. So, Mother Fair, I want to um I wanted to already shift the conversation. We don't have much time left, but I think it's important for us to talk about uh what community policing looks like. You know, what what are our steps moving forward aside from the steps that you stated that we need to take the work we need to do on changing policy and it was good that we went over that just yes. to this is the issue this these this is the work that we need to do everybody came together that's great that's great let's keep that energy and let's start trying to shift this uh change this yes. policy it's be, uh, way but, beyond protest but along with that what are some things within us that we need to because some something that I saw and I was hoping Carrie would be here to talk with her about it. But I think it's an example of something that I feel is going on within us as well for community policing. I saw that only women, she said only women could speak. Right. And I wanted to ask her what the intention was behind that. But it made me wonder, is there something is there too much of a implicit bias and division within us for us to even move forward in changing policy or standing in solidarity? So we do have you a lot of work. We have a lot of work to do uh, uh, with us. Um, and, and one of the big things is we got to see the broader picture of all of this, because um, for me, when when I see people come on protests, it's usually after somebody's been shot or killed. And and for some people, I guess that's police brutality. They don't see what happened to me and my daughter as mm. police brutality. Yet we're suffering two and three years later. Right. So that gets no attention. So we have to scale back on all the getting out here only when it's somebody who's gotten shot and killed. And getting back to us, we have so much work to do with ourselves, so many egos that have to be put aside, so yes. many agendas that have to be taken out of this movement. Because for me, this is a movement. Yes. For many people, it's a moment. We're talking about this case, and we're going to be gone in a few weeks. And that's what the police expect. Get Let them have their protest because you know they're going to be going, they ain't going to be bothering. And I say there's a difference between those people and me. Right. Oh, best believe the, that. And the difference is... They can handle the annoyance of you coming out and protesting, mm -hmm. but they, what what they can't handle is the threat that you want to dismantle this system. Mm. And so that's why when all these hundreds of people was on the green that day and they were doing all kinds of stuff, fighting, uh, throwing smoke bombs, all of that. And who did they pull out that's of the crowd? Right. That's right. The and only one that was a threat to them. And you know what's crazy is just a, a side note. Rem and I were there covering that right after that. They, those same people that are supposed to protect us, right? That they were not supposed to, but that's who they said to be on yeah. the outside. Went over to the green dancing to Justin Timberlake's mm -hmm. Can't Fight the Feeling. Mm -hmm. I remember that. Yes, sir. They don't have the same struggle we have. No. Yes, sir. Not at all. So, and, uh, and, uh, we, we only have a couple minutes left. So I want to, what I, what I want to do is I would like us before we leave, um, yeah. Okay, I would like us before we leave to be able to solidify a time, no press, 
you know, we could do it off air and we're going to let the people know where we're going to meet to really strategize because it's time to really bring us together and really go over next steps. Uh, Brother Youssef. Well, I've just spoke to um, the uh, the director of the station and we are going to continue this conversation. Okay. Um, uh, on the electric drum, we want everybody to stay because we know that this is a very important issue and we need to continue uh, this conversation. Uh, so uh, Absolutely. once you wrap up, uh, Jay, we're um, gonna come back. We'll come back. That's great. Okay. Um, with the electric drum, uh, with Yusuf Shah, and we want everybody to stay, um, if we can. All right, that's great. Um, so le let's. I, I want to uh, before we end, Mother Fair. Um, are there aside from policy? What are some other things within us, or we, even with the younger generation? When we talk about the younger generation taking leadership, and you being the one who has been holding down the legacy. I mean, you're. You're a legend in our community for what you do. So we appreciate you for that. How do you feel the changing of the guards needs to happen? Do you feel like there needs to be the elders bringing it over to the younger people? That, for me personally, that's how I'm feeling. And my, and my children especially are, are telling me, Ma, please, because they look at how leaders get shot and killed. Yeah. So they're, they're always constantly pushing on me to stop. But I tell them, I want to hand the, the banner down, but I don't want it to drop. Right. When I hand it down, people need to the younger people. I'm I'm so grateful that they they see the need to push forward. But don't forget about the people, the shoulders that you stand on, because Absolutely. all the time that I've been doing this work is on the shoulders of the people who came before me. Yeah. I hear their messages in my ear and they're they guide me to where I am. Mm. And that's all I ask of the young people. I don't need to be in the front. I don't even want to be in the front, but at least let me help me guide. Yeah, like, How, and, and the perfect example is when we went to Hamden. They're all outside having a nice protest outside, and I said, "People, our power has to go inside. The police are behind that door. They're behind them glasses. They don't even hear you. They totally ignore you. And then you, you need to take inside. that inside. And that's when we went inside. And that's when we was heard. And that's when some movement started happening. And I would and encourage. That's what I'm here I would for. encourage our young people to move with some humility, humble yourself, and understand and witness the wise, the wisdom that our elders have to offer. You don't know everything. Stop being so impressed by the camera and who's getting the light and who's getting the shine. Come together. Stop Solidarity, be humble and witness and understand the wisdom that is being given to us by our elders. We'll be continuing this conversation with the electric drum with Yusef Shaw. It's 94.3 WYBC. Now I know.